You're listening to Friends from Work. Good morning and welcome back to another episode of Friends from Work. I had Trix cereal this morning for the first time wow. in forever. When's the last time you had Trix cereal? Tricks are for kids. Slash, Good do you question. have a favorite sugary cereal? Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm a big cereal head over here. You Wait, know? are you really? Uh, I am, yeah. Canda, oh, it's funny oh. because um, it's one of those things where like Candace and I are just totally diametrically opposed. She like has no use for, for cereal. Uh, I eat it almost every day, but Wait, not for, for breakfast. Real? It's like a nighttime ritual for me. Like just a little, like little, little cup of. I didn't know this about you. Bed. It's nice. I, my, if, if like anyone is listening, including my trainer, he would be <laughs> horrified, but milk. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Although we, we're, we are generally a non, a non dairy household these days. Almond milk. We I go back between various alternatives. Right now, we're we're doing uh, soy because that is apparently the one that's offers the most nutritionally. I'm an almond milk guy. But what cereal? I though? like almond milk. So too. if you're if you're a cereal head, what do you yeah. go? What's your go to then? It's 9 p.m. at night. You're watching a show. So I, there is a cereal right now that. Uh, they they we've been getting it's called three wishes i don't know if you've seen this but it's it's kind of like a it's like <laughs> a cereal you that's like three wishes of course it's three wishes you couldn't say lucky charms or something no no, like no. That? okay just wait just wait that is the I, again i'm eating this like every night so if i'm eating like that okay, okay, much okay. Fair you know fair. processed whatever <laughs> i would like either be gone already or last forever <laughs> i guess depending on how you look at it at that sort of thing. You might be building uh, up your immunity. If I were, if, if I were to look at like my favorite, just putting any of those concerns aside, I, it's hard to beat lucky charms. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm also like, you know, if, if I'm willing to go through the pain of it, I love a good bowl of captain crunch. Captain crunch. I knew it. Yeah. Cinnamon toast crunch. Berries. Oh, not berries. all berries. That's a little too much. Crunch but berries. Just crunch berries. Yeah. But uh Cinnamon Toast Crunch. For oh, sure, yeah. Captain Crunch ruins your mouth for sure, but I like it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh wow. Did you Classic. ever there's no time? I feel for like this we today, might have though. talked about this years ago. There's no yes. way. But there was a um there was a a Winnie the Pooh branded cereal that oh my came gosh. out. For it would have been when we were probably in late elementary school, and it was some limited time thing, but it made such an impact. It was it was this kind of like honey flavored thing, and then years later, I went back and I found all these like subreddits dedicated to talking about how great this cereal was that was only available for like this. There are so time. many mean things I could say right now, but I'm not going to. I'm choosing not to. Is it is it based on the the Winnie the Pooh of it or the subreddit of it? The fact that you're in a subreddit looking for Winnie the Pooh cereal. I didn't say I was in the subreddit. I said that I I uncovered the subreddit. Look, I was. You started. Curious, you're a moderator. <laughs> is this is this the sort of thing? that other people remember? Is this something that even like it was noted culturally? And so, you know, when you find some validation, some community, sure, it sticks with you. No time. No time today. I just turned off X-Men 97 episode five called Remember It like an hour ago. You and I got a chance to talk with Isaac Robinson Smith, who plays Bishop. Mm -hmm. That will be towards the end of this episode. You're not going to want to miss it. He was so kind. All these mm -hmm. people are always so kind, but I was telling you, you get a little bit nervous or intimidated before and you see their name in the lobby. Then when they join the call, you're like, oh, this guy's actually just super cool and down to earth and easy to talk mm -hmm. to. And that was this conversation. Just so much fun. So you're not going to want to miss that. And such a fan of the, of, yes. the, 
new show and and the original and yeah, I think kind of the it's perfect a, person to talk to about this. And it ties regardless in, of his role. Right. It ties in so perfectly with what we're going to talk about here in a second. There's no time. Because of that, I just want to get right into this. Mm -hmm. There are levels to my excitement. There are a lot of things I like in life. Just like, you know, there are circles of friends, right? Everyone has them. You have your absolute uh -huh. inner circle who you tell anything to. But then mm -hmm. you have, you know, you have friends that you get together with once every two months and they're, they're easy to talk to and you don't miss a lot when you're gone and you can just catch up really easily. And then, you know, the circle grows, you have friends, then you have acquaintances and then you have people that you know, right. but they wouldn't really recognize you. There are levels to my excitement. I'm not sure I'll ever feel the way I felt after infinity war and Endgame ever again, that that's possible that sure. that never gets recreated. I, remember feeling so much during the WandaVision era. I remember thinking like, I just, I just, everything is, re, is emotionally resonating with me and I can't wait to see where we're going just constantly. Mm -hmm. And so there are levels of my excitement. WandaVision is up there with that infinity war and Endgame feeling for me. I'm not saying it's as good of a project, but that's how I feel. And I have liked a lot of stuff that we've watched. I like Shang-Chi. I like Wakanda forever. I like Loki season one. I like Moon Knight. There are a lot of things that I really, really like, but dude, I haven't called you out of sheer excitement like 10 minutes after I watched it mm -hmm. in a long time like I did today. I shut off this episode and I immediately felt that feeling again of I have to tell somebody. And that's mm. how this podcast started is that feeling. Now, again, not to the mm -hmm. same degree, but this is the first time in a while I had that feeling. Like I liked Echo, but I didn't have this feeling. I didn't have the feeling of like, oh my gosh, I have to call Robbie. Annika, don't watch it. I'll rewatch it tonight with you. I want to be there when you see it the first wow. time. Like that kind of like rush for me, it's been a while. And I think our listeners need that back. They need Kyle back. They need mm -hmm. Kyle back. And this episode gave me a taste of that. I don't know if he'll ever get to those wow. levels, but dude, I don't know what you thought. I thought this was masterful. I told you the first episode was good. I was getting my bearings. Second episode, mm -hmm. big step up cliffhanger ending. Now I'm kind of in third episode. Oh my gosh. They got me. I'm fully in weird with the hell stuff. Fourth episode. Okay. We took a step back for me. I'm, I'm less invested. I don't know the trajectory mm -hmm. now. It was a mountain. We took a little step. Where are we going? This is the best one by far to me. This wasn't even close. The, the emotional core, the musical moments we got, the theme hit me harder than ever. It has the typical Disney plus episode four or five type twist at the yeah, end where yeah. the credits are now haunting. It's different. This is the low point for the characters. The action was intriguing. I thought all the voice acting is finally settled in. It, mm -hmm. it was genuinely moving in the writing and the voice acting. I thought Gambit's line at the end of my name's Gambit. Remember it. I have chills right now. Like that got me, dude. Like that is perfect mm -hmm. writing. That is like that line feels like the what is grief thing from WandaVision to me where I hear it. I go, what a perfect way to execute what you're trying to do. So right. I'm just excited right now. I'll let you talk. No, no. I mean, I think like we, we haven't gotten to talk about this yet. Um, you called me before I had seen it and I know uh, so I couldn't tell you anything. It's uh, first. What I love about this is how well it worked for you as someone that not only had very little investment in this particular iteration of the, of the X-Men, but very little investment in the X-Men as a property. I mean, it's been growing as we've been going through the films and the show, but uh, that in itself is impressive because I, I think that, you know, you start talking about Infinity War and Endgame, that is still the high watermark, you know, the end of Infinity War in, in terms of that, like what just, like what just happened and, and like, what are the implications of this? And you're going to walk away and sit with it. But, you know, that had the benefit of of a decade of investment behind it. And I think that that was the first thing that popped in my head finishing this episode is like the the ending with Rogue saying, I can't feel you, not only is kind of a, a 
callback to the line from one division, the parallel there. One division, well, 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 but also well, also Infinity War too. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and also like the the final scene with Cap, like the oh god, it's so like you're you're sitting in it. The the music that you get in the outro credits, that's all so powerfully I done. I have chills, right? But now. it's also it it's just so impressive that it's done in the animated context and that five episodes into this the series, they're able to land something in a way that has so much uh, emotional weight. And it, just in case you don't know, like the Gambit line is even better because the remember it is is kind of a frequent catchphrase of his from the original series. Oh, so see, it's, I had no, no idea. No but, idea. That but that's a, what I love is it's not it's not done with too much of a of a nod and a wink. Like it's just enough to where it's like if you know, you know, and if you don't, it's just a great kind of personality moment for him. It's like the moment where you like I I, I love that practice of titling an episode something and and you don't understand what that title means until you do. And th- like the right. fact that you have that in in that kind of a moment. And also that Gambit is one of these characters that has such a following and people have loved him ever since, you know, the, the comics, particularly in the nineties when I feel like he, he really takes off, but in, in this series, but he's also generally one of the lesser X-Men in terms of his power set. You know, it's like you look at all of the other players and, and like Magneto, Magneto even makes the comment in the jet when they're on their way to Genosha, like of all of us, you're the one that that would certainly have an issue with gravity, you know, if, if something Good happened. Point. And I love that it's him, though, not Magneto. I mean, Magneto still has an incredible moment at the end, so it's not that it detracts. But of all of the powerful mutants that are there and like the Omega mutant that is Magneto, I thought it was so like surprising and refreshing and moving that it's Gambit who has just not only been dealing with that kind of like ego push for Magneto, but also now dealing with the fact that he's been essentially dumped and kind of told not, you know, I don't want to be unfair to, to Rogue's character here, but he's been put on the back burner in more ways than one. So for him to have that moment, on multiple levels, I thought it was just, you're right. It was masterfully executed in, in a way that like, I'm, I'm still kind of coming to grips with. The Gambit stuff was so unbelievable. You're right. The scene before where he says, well, we're just friends then. And that's where he left it last before this all went down. And then he still chooses to be an absolute hero, like legend mm-hmm. status. And then he got stabbed and when he got stabbed and it went silent with the music, I was like, Oh gosh, they're going there. Mm -hmm. But then for him to have one last hurrah, that is powerful enough to take down these things that other people were struggling to take down is pretty cool redemption. And then the, I can't feel you is brutal at the end. Mm -hmm. The Magneto stuff. I'm glad you brought that up is also magnificent for so many reasons. I think because they are really heavily leaning into him actually turning a leaf yeah. And is it turning a leaf or turning a page? Turning, turning a, a new leaf? Turning, turning over a, a new leaf? leaf? Turning over a new leaf in that he is, it seems like he's actually trying to do the right thing, but it's going to make him maybe going rogue, pun intended, that much mm. better if it ever gets there. So if he now snaps because of this and because of human interaction that was involved maybe to some degree with this, mm-hmm. if that happens it's going to be that much more effective because they're really actually getting me to buy in that he's trying to do the right thing. So like they took this character of leech that nobody cares about at all. And it's a total Mm -hmm. lame character. And it made this super moving moment at the end where he's actually in this, whatever you would call it, like a bubble of protection and got a tear down his, and he has a tear going down his face. And so does leech and Magneto's, doing everything he can to protect him. And then that was like a full twist. Like, oh gosh, he's yeah. actually going to die. I don't think he did, but he's actually going to be willing to die for what he thinks is the right thing. And I I think that that highlights something about the Magneto character that the 
the films have actually, they've gotten right to some degree, but I don't know that they've been given the opportunity to, to really capitalize on it. I think but, that's one thing that's throwing me off a little bit because like fast mm, benders, Magneto in first class and especially in days of future past, isn't very similar to this character. He, I mean, he's younger, I get it, but he's he's way more aggressive. I never yeah. get that feeling of he's looking out for other people other than himself. Like every time like someone corners him, like Charles, and says like, oh, you're doing mm-hmm. the right thing, he's kind of like, oh, not me, I'm you know, uncomfortable with it. Right. Now, maybe no, this, well, is, no, a, I, this I think, is a more advanced Magneto, more like McKellen. Yeah. And I, well, I, I do like also that they are showing the way, like in, in the, especially in the, the Fassbender portrayal, his background coming from the the Holocaust and being forged there, I, I think presents more as just kind of rage and vengeance, which is obviously fair and, and is kind of this undercurrent here too. Sure. But I think that what was really powerful here is that you get that moment where like, once again, what he has always said would happen, like they will eventually come for us. They are like they've he's played by the books. He's done everything right. He's like trying to follow Charles playbook. And not only is he being proven right in the worst way, he's also now like sitting there trying to protect innocent people that are caught up in something once again. And I think the way that Leech factors into that and the the moment that they have, I love like the the thing about the show that I think is so impressive is that's a moment where a, a clunkier writer or storyteller would have given some like on the nose kind of flashback or or tried to make that more heavy handed than it needed to be. But it's it's more just you you understand at this point, even just in this series, who Magneto is, what motivates him, what defines him. And so the moment of realizing not only like is is this all coming back again but it's also this moment of like he's tried so hard to protect even just then in in that instant to protect these like the weaker mutants from this like genocide basically and he knows in that moment that he's done all he can do and it's just such a like brutal gut punch the whole back i mean the whole back what it's It's only like eight minutes probably of this episode, but it's like you can't take a breath. Okay. We'll be right back with way more of this stuff. Okay. Essentially all we have talked about this far is that, the Gambit thing was magnificent. The Magneto part of it was magnificent. I have some other mm-hmm. stuff that I liked. Let's talk about Genosha for a second. I know nothing of this. Okay. So talk to me as if I know nothing. Uh, Cause I don't, <laughs> uh, I love it. When does it come about? Could the MCU ever work towards something like this? Is it possible that like starting in phase five or six, we see a film where like here, here's a crazy idea, but maybe mm-hmm. in the Eternals Tiamat wreckage, maybe instead of an Avengers base, could it be something like Genosha or something? And that's where they start it hmm. or something like that. Because I think you'd have a hard time in the MCU saying it's existed the whole time. Right. That wouldn't, I don't think that'd fly right, at right. this point. Um, well, is it super important to the comics? Talk to me about it in general. Yeah. So it, first off within this universe, as and this was, again, smartly done. There was a shout out to Genosha in episode four, whenever Jubilee's going back and doing the, the video I game that. stuff. Yeah. And so I, I think it's, it's important to know that in the series, it's initially presented as like a mutant paradise and you go and it's like a resort and it's a place where you can kind of be freely a mutant. And then it winds up being actually like a, a sinister thing and, and it's like a work camp and it gets really dark and they have the collars and all that. And so I think that oh. it eventually within that universe transforms into an actual version of that. And, you know, we see that kind of come to a head here with 
the UN recognizing it and it being a, a real nation in its own right. In the comics, which is kind of where we're meeting up, it is, you know, it, it's it's fairly similar in terms of its history. Uh, it's it's a place that Magneto is really involved in because obviously it kind of fits with his goals. However, I think what I did not expect in the series it, is how far ahead they they jumped in terms of the the comic runs that they're pulling from now i had seen in some of the press leading into the show that rather than just focusing in on the 70s and 80s comics that the original series did and that the series has so far uh with 97 that they were going to start dabbling with some stuff further in the 90s and even in the early early 2000s I didn't know if that meant like we were kind of marching through and that would be like a later in the series thing or, or later seasons, but they are now fully in Grant Morrison, new X-Men territory, Grant Morrison and Frank quietly, I should say. And, and that is really fun and also really exciting story wise because Grant Morrison is one of these writers that is known for kind of coming in and, and totally reimagining things. And that's one of the things that he did in, in X-Men to do that is this attack on Genosha, the death of Magneto by these, what he calls wild sentinels, sorry, <clears throat> by these wild sentinels. Uh, and that sets the stage for kind of a redefining of who we know Magneto to be, who we know the X-Men to be. It's also a run that deals with... Uh, the X-Men in some ways in the absence of, of Xavier as they've known him. And so it's like, I, I think now that we're kind of touching up against that, I, I love that the show can jump back and forth among different runs and it's not going to be married to this, but I'm curious coming out of this. Like, I, I think I flagged a couple episodes ago, the, the Magneto was right showing up in you some, did. some context you saw that probably on the like sign uh, as they're coming into Genosha. Like I said, of the comics, that comes about after Magneto has been essentially martyred. And it's this, you know, look, Magneto was right all along. Like he was always saying, this is what would happen. Look, this is what happened. I mean, in the comics, I think it's, it's millions of mutants that are massacred. I don't get the sense that we're looking at that kind of numbers or those kinds of numbers within the context of the show. But to answer your question, like globally, Genosha is a, it is a big part of the comics in terms of the, especially the impact that it's had on, on Magneto and the way that mutants are perceived as a people. But I think that it has to be said, some of what this show was drawing from is some of the more recent Jonathan Hickman X-Men Krakoa stuff that you may have heard about, and we can get more into that down the line. But that's where they kind of circle all the way back to this idea of what would it look like to go fully into a mutant nation that is not just recognized by other nations, but kind of superior to them and willing to embrace that. And so you see like mutant government developing and those sorts of things. And I'm, I don't, again, they're not adapting that yet, but they're definitely playing with these ideas of like a mutant council and representatives from both kind of the villains and also the heroes. And I think that it's really exciting anytime you can see creators work all of these things in, in a way that feels so so seamless. So there's a lot like there's a I love that it works so well for you without you having any of this background. But if you do have all this background, it works on another level where it's just it's fun to see and and you know, it's impressive to see. Couple of quick things here. Nightcrawler was so cool to me. I loved the accent he mm -hmm. had, the voice he was using. I love the music that played when he showed up, which perfectly leads me to my next point, which is that I thought the music here was fantastic. The Newton brothers just murdered this soundtrack during this episode. Mm -hmm. 
part of it probably is that I watched this episode at my studio with my studio speaker. So you can really hear the mix. And so mm-hmm. I really could tell like some thought has gone into some of these musical moments. There's a moment where Scott and Gene are arguing and there's this beautiful lost esque piano track going underneath. I did some research on the composers and found out that they worked with Hans Zimmer to get their mm. start. Like they studied with him, which makes mm-hmm. perfect sense when you hear that piano track that's playing under uh, what Scott and Gene are arguing about. But then, yeah, cool song for Nightcrawler, cool song for Genosha. The music in general was really cool. And then on my speakers, oh my gosh, the theme slaps when it finally kicks in. And so like, oh, man, I love yeah. kicking into the theme whenever they get into these action bits as well. It just, it, it really works for me on so many levels. Also, Changing subjects again. Did you catch that little shout out to the astral plane? I loved yeah. Cyclops using yeah. that terminology. I've never heard that outside of the Doctor Strange realm. And so I kind of love someone else confirming that. I'm trying to remember if that phrase was used in the original series. Uh, hmm. But, you yeah, know, or is, is that an addition because of the MCU? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and it, it should be said if we didn't talk about this in our. Uh, and our X-Men primer, the, the X-Men animated series was set in a universe that includes technically Dr. Strange and Spider-Man. And, and that's, so I, I like that that door is always kind of open, which actually, did you see the, the, the Easter egg as we're talking about MCU uh, relationships here? I think, and I need to go back and see it, but I'm pretty sure I saw, mm-hmm. like, right as the the massacre is is unfolding or about to unfold, it mm-hmm. looks like you can see the Watcher, like, oh, in the sky, looking down. Am I crazy? Can. No, you're not crazy, which is insane. Man, and also, really we learned from the What If series that the Watcher watches the most important events, right? So Mm -hmm. what a cool tie in. Yeah. And again, such a subtle one. Like, I really appreciate that, that it's not, it's not something that takes away from what they're doing there. It's just like a blink and you miss it thing. I thought I heard a rumor or I saw this online. And so this is reckless. And so this is reckless speculation here. So don't take Mm -hmm. this for gospel. I thought I saw a rumor that Jeffrey Wright is going to be, in a live action thing as the watcher, what project would that be? Like coming up, maybe Fantastic Four? Question mark. Yeah, I could see that. I don't, I don't know. Or, there's there's somewhere that he's rumored to actually be. I mean, Deadpool character would make sense, honestly. Yeah, maybe it's Deadpool. I, uh, it might have been yeah, Deadpool. I can't man. remember. Sorry, that would be fun. Okay, two other things, and then a question, and that's all I have. One. I absolutely loved how the drama soap opera romance was handled here. This is like the Mm. peak version of it to me. You have very real feelings and wrestling with feelings between Scott and Gene. And then Gene out of confusion kisses Logan. And then Logan's Mm -hmm. confused by that. That feels so like that's a perfect execution of the love triangle. Honestly, more than what I complained about in our X one and X two coverage. I thought that was one of the weaker points of those movies. Yeah. Yeah. And those movies are very, very good. This felt like believable in so many ways because Jean's confused. She doesn't remember who is her. Like Scott Mm -hmm. is confused. He had a baby with this girl, Jean, but he technically had a baby with her clone, not her. So he's like, I don't, I don't know if I can even yeah. say that I love you. Like, do you love the memory of me or do you love me? Like, you don't even know. So I love that. Then I love mm-hmm. flashing to this rogue and Magneto and Gambit stuff and trying to figure out that and how rogue can't touch anybody, but it's more than just the touching of the skin as Gambit says. And then she goes and kisses Magneto and realizes, Oh, he's right. It's not just that I can touch Magneto. That's not the only thing. So then she kind of comes full circle back to the scene with Gambit mm-hmm. only for Gambit to then die. Like this was the peak version of how to handle these love triangles and romance and soap opera ness. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it, that's that's like whenever I told you when we started the show, like get ready for some some space opera meets soap opera, like we like we talk about uh, with with Isaac here in a bit, knowing what to lean into and when, and I think that's a perfect example of that. My last major point 
I just love how the dread of what was about to happen was executed. Like you're in the middle of dealing with this soap opera and this heartbreak and these interpersonal dynamics. And then it just shifts where this Mm -hmm. guy comes through this portal and he's like, he's coming. You got to move. You got to run. It's too late. And all of a sudden the music shifts in tone, it gets dark. And then the actual visual of those sentinels, just their eyes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the horror of it, it's an animated show. And I felt the horror, like, I'm just going to say it. Like this was impacting me on so many levels in a way that what if never did. Like I felt the horror and that's not a bash to what if I just was connected to this, the horror of what was going down. And Mm -hmm. that tonal shift was so good, which leads me to my last question, which is, I think I gathered what you were referencing last week in that this guy that shows up cable, that's Nathan from the future, right? Because she says she recognizes his eyes. Okay. That was my last thing. I think that was Mm -hmm. what I was supposed to take away from that. Well, and I love that Madeline is there to have that moment with him, you know, that it's, it's like of all the people like one, I, I, it, again, there were just so many moving pieces here, but it made so much sense in terms of Jean and Scott's dynamic that she would be in Genosha, that she would be having the conversations that she's having prior to that. But then the fact that she's there to like have the, Like the first time the blood comes out of her nose and it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then that all leading up to him coming out and talking to her, apologizing, and then everything just, it was. The blood out of the nose too. That's so Lost-esque. Remember in Lost, whenever they would time travel and then their nose started bleeding, that was a bad sign. Oh, yeah, yeah. uh, What else does that? I'm trying to think. There's something else we just watched that does the same kind of technique, like the nosebleed means, uh oh, it's about to get real I know, bad for I you. I mean, Stranger Things does that. In Stranger a Things, way. maybe that's what I'm thinking of. It does that as well. But yeah, that that I, look, uh, look, that's all I had. I was so freaking ecstatic about it that I called you. I've been doing this weekly. I would now say my power ranking so far would be episode five, three, mm-hmm. two, one, four. But this, this to me was. The best yeah. animated thing they've ever created, animated for sure, mm-hmm. um, on par with the best Disney Plus shows they have, and probably as an isolated thing, we don't do this, but would be a tier one episode where like, yeah. I feel like it was executed as well as Winter Soldier executes its thing. Mm-hmm. Totally different things, but but for what, what they doing. were going for. Yeah. So yeah. I loved it, man. No, I, I'm so excited now to see not only where this goes, but how, like, I, I I thought something that we didn't talk about a ton, but I think will come into play next week. The reaction from the X-Men at the mansion, I thought was so heartbreaking, especially Hank. And oh, yeah. I'm reminded that our next week episode is the second part of the life death story that started last week with storm and i'm curious how this news factors into that like if we're going to see storm seeing this and if that's going to have like oh. there's going to be some kind of like emotional trigger for her that allows her to kind of reclaim the ability or like if it's going to be something where she does reclaim her powers and then you know is so excited only to see that like this huge tragedy has befallen and the team is wrecked. And so it's like, I, I, I actually really appreciate that we started that story, went away for such a, a monumental episode. And then now are kind of left wondering how that will impact the threads that we were following prior. In hindsight, it's almost important now that we got to see storm for a second first, just to remind us as viewers, like, Oh yeah, she's still out there as a human right now. Yeah. And then look what happens here. And then maybe that will affect it. You're right. Good call out. Because it is, it's kind of weird that she in some ways, you know, is not, yeah, she's not really like a mutant right now. So I feel like she would have such complicated feelings about identifying with what's happened. And obviously it's still her teammates, but. And 
don't get me wrong here. We didn't really get confirmation of Magneto's fate, right? No, no, I think. So even uh, that's a thing I want to follow up on. Yeah. And you know, and, and the, on the comic side of this, that's something that's handled so well that I almost don't really want to spoil anything in case they go that route. Okay. Don't then, but don't, 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 don't. But I will say, uh, as I'm referencing this stuff, we, I'm feeling a little bit vindicated, uh, on our organic price books, friends from work recommends section that folks oh, will yeah. remember. We, we put up towards the end of 2023 our coming soon selection was the new X-Men omnibus by Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley. And so if people want to know specifically some of the background for this story, but also I, I realized the other day, I think another major character that was introduced in that run is going to make an appearance in Deadpool and Wolverine, or at least is rumored to. So I think that that will be yet another way that that will be relevant. So I would highly recommend people go to Organic Price Books and you can go either through the Friends from Work Recommends section or just search for New X-Men. I think it's already on back order, uh, which is to say like a, it, it's probably going fairly quickly. So I would recommend people, if you're listening, to go and snag one of those. Uh, and as always, use the code friends from work to get an extra discount. But uh, that is regardless of where you get it, I would recommend everybody read that run, especially if you were interested in the events of uh, this week's episode. And while you're reading that run, why don't you wear a shirt like Robbie's wearing right now? Look at that. I haven't seen that. Yeah, look at that. Holy cow. I've been been waiting for an excuse to. Well, and I don't know if you saw this. this. We officially got a look at Wolverine wearing that. Uh, yesterday I saw the news. So oh, I did not now. see that. Yeah. So you can look up that exact thing oh, on your man. shirt. So good call out there. Nerd riot dot shop, organic price books.com and nerd riot dot shop, both promo codes, friends from work. And those links are in our show notes below. Okay. Don't turn this off yet because we chat with Bishop and you're not going to want to miss this conversation. It's short, but it's jam packed with a bunch of good material. And so don't turn this off. You're going to hear from Isaac Robinson Smith in one second. Isaac Robinson Smith, welcome to Friends from Hello. Work. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. This is great. What yes. a treat. Bishop, for those yes. who don't know. Yes. The voice of Bishop. Can you give us our best Bishop voice right now? Like, let me hear a Bishop voice. Give it to me. It's really great to be here. <laughs> oh, my fun. God. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was way that, better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> that's shockingly just it, it's to see it happen. I, I love yes. that. Yeah, I, I told uh, a couple of people the, the direction I got when I originally got the role when I was first doing it was a black Clint Eastwood. And so I just kind of ran with that kind of oh, mentality and that excellent. kind of voice placement. I was like, OK, I feel like I know where this guy's going to sit. So, <laughs> yeah, this is where I live. Well, oh that's, my gosh, that's, that's actually, incredible, actually. Yeah. One of my I mean, that leads into kind of my, my first question here. Yeah. Uh, did you watch just as a fan growing up the original X-Men 97 series? I or sorry, did. the original X-Men animated series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I did. It, it was in pieces, though, just because uh, I was watching a lot of other things at the same time. So I know that I watched full episodes, and I know that I really enjoyed it. But, like, I was also watching Batman the Animated Series and Spider-Man oh, yeah. the Animated right. Series and all that other stuff. Like, just the the peak of animation for kids, I feel, in oh, my opinion, man. was at that, mm-hmm. po- that point in history. So yeah, you're watching a lot of other choir. stuff. Yeah, but I mean, it was such a great experience to see it and to then go from that to this. Like, I mean, I know that it must have been really important to me at some point when I was a kid, because when I saw the audition come through and I knew they were bringing it back, when I figured that out, like everything was, Mm -hmm. I got excited in a way I haven't felt in years. And so I was like, this is going to be pretty amazing. Like, I was really excited to be a part of it. Um, once I got what the news did you get first, by the way, did you get news that you were going to be in it or did you hear just on Twitter that it was coming back? So interestingly, um, and they will do this sometimes for auditions for various shows. They sent out the auditions in kind of, um, a couple of waves. And so like for, like for big video games, for example, sometimes they'll send out like the main characters and then they'll kind of 
go down down the list of the characters they need. So they'll, we'll, we'll see the same project come out a few times, but different pieces of mm-hmm. it. And so I had initially seen the audition for um, kind of the first wave of the characters, kind of the ones we all remember, kind of the main the other ones there, the main ones there. Um, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know if I went out for any of those originally, maybe a couple. But then I got the audition for this about maybe a two or three, four weeks later or so. Mm. Um, and I just like any other audition, I recorded it. This is my studio. I recorded it here and I sent it out and I mm. like a month went by. And then I was in a session for a game called Starfield that I did voice work okay. in for Bethesda. Mm-hmm. And I got an email on my phone and I couldn't do anything because I was in a session. So I was working and I couldn't tell anybody because it was a huge secret. So just like I had to contain <laughs> oh, this right. massive excitement that I was just I'm part of it. I don't know what this means yet, but I'll get back to it later. <laughs> but, you know, it was so it was really great. Um, and then I started Man. recording it uh, a little over two years ago. So it's been. Oh, gosh. I mean, yeah. So the patience for this stuff is wild because you don't. I, the first time I saw it all together was honestly the premiere when we had it on that that Wednesday afternoon. Wow. Wednesday evening mm-hmm. at the El Capitan. Um, that's the first time I'd seen the theme song fully fleshed out the, the music, the sound effect, all that stuff. I was meeting cast members for the first time because we all work individually. So yeah. like uh-huh. that was a wild experience, but anyway. I think sometimes we forget how long ago that was. Like when we were full disclosure off air, when we were talking, yeah. we were saying, I haven't seen today's episode yet. I've heard it's really good. Yeah. And we're like, well, right. you actually narrate the previously on, yeah. but then you're like, well, <laughs> uh-huh. It's been two years. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And, and that's, that, yes. I just remember when we were first talking with some folks that were involved with What If, it was the same thing. It was like, yeah. man, animation just takes so long. Yeah. That, that process, the turnaround time is really unique. It's amazing. And uh, I was ex- I was one of the first people to be involved with What If on an early, early stage. I was just doing some scratch voiceover, like way before it was even oh, I mean, wow. it was becoming a show. But that was my first like connection with Marvel animation in general. I was working mm-hmm. on doing early voice scratch voiceover is what it's called. When you do the initial voiceover to do, to go along with the storyboards so they can get the mm-hmm. story approved. And then, but then they brought me on to do some voices for the show, which was cool, but it was amazing to watch that process because like I would get a script and I would do it. And if there was an alteration, they would destroy that entire script and then bring a whole new one to me. Like they're, they lock the stories huh. down like super it's, it's amazing. Wow. They're really, really amazing Man. with their story and how they protect it. You brought up Starfield. I noticed on your page that uh, you've done a ton of video game work, including yes. a little a little part in Spider Man Two, which you're talking yes. to the right people here. Yes. Oh man, yep. that was that was fun. Yeah, I I'm just a bunch of pedestrians throughout New York. I found myself as a crazy person <laughs> proclaiming incredible. the world was going to end in Central Park, and I did. I was part of the Oscorp security when you know you're first playing as Venom, and you know uh-huh. that whole that's, deal. Oh, that's oh fun. yes. Yeah. So that was really fun. I love that team. John Pazino, who does the music, is a good friend of the show. So oh, that's great. Oh, them we'll together. tell him. I, I sometimes just swing around to listen to the score, honestly, because oh, it's so much so fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. But I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> how is video game, if at all, different than voice work for a show like this, an animated show? Is it different or are you kind of doing the same thing? It's very different just because, I mean, the, the base of all of it is acting. So that, that part of it stays true, but the difference in how it gets done is very different just because in an animation project, the script is written out and you're going through a narrative that is being viewed by the audience. But in the video game world, because the player is the director, there's a billion different ways that the player could go. So you have to record every single line of every option of what the <clears throat> person could do, um, how they could be interacting mm-hmm. with other characters. Mm-hmm. So like I just did a, um, a game a couple of days ago um, where I was playing somebody against the main character. And so I had to do, you know, all the variations of kind of all the variations of we found you or we got you or I see you like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember actually talking to the Starfield uh, writer. She was on the call for one of these sessions And it's an open world Bethesda game, so it's already big. But like I I asked her and I said, how much are you doing? And she said something like she'd written over 200,000 lines for this game. Um, And that's broken up over years and and characters like I did two pretty solid four hour sessions for my character to get through every single. It says this, which means this, which means branches off to here. Um, then so you it's think just, about the other open world games where yeah. your reaction changes based on the decision. Like I, exactly. I, I think about that sometimes like one little side sequence needed a hundred lines of dialogue, yeah. depending on how you exactly you know, play the game. Or Crazy. like when I did work for the Marvel Avengers game, I did a whole conversation, yeah. like a whole three pages with somebody 
you don't even you wouldn't even hear it if you didn't stop. It's one of those conversations that's just happening as you're walking past, but they need it so that mm. the world feels built wow. up. Um, so it's the same kind of fun, you know, work with characters and all that. But it's just it's a lot. It's more involved in that way just because they need to make sure that every possibility is taken care of. Whereas animation, you have, you know, the script that stuff's already there. Yeah. But you do get right. choices in how to play it because the animation generally comes after the voice performance. So the best way I heard it is you got to give the animator something to draw. So your performance has to make the whole el- thing rise and elevate to what it is. Forgive me if this is stupid. Are you watching anything when you're reading? No. Or not? Not Nothing. really. Um, for, uh, hmm. you know, I'll use this as an example. Um, that's the reason that I, you know, kind of have forgotten is because when we come in for these sessions, sometimes there will be ADR that we're doing, which means the picture has been locked and the animation is done and we're just watching mm-hmm. and then we're adding our voice to whatever they've decided. We need an extra moment here, an extra line here, or change the emphasis here. Um, but generally for this, you know, you come in and it's the script, it's you and the script and the director and the engineer and maybe a couple mm-hmm. people on the team on Zoom on the other side, but there's nothing else. There's no music. There's nothing to watch. It's um, theater of the mind is the way I've heard it before because it's all all of it is up here to mm. really create. And you're reading the description and you're kind of filling out the world. Um, and that's the fun mm. and the challenge of voiceover is because it's so expansive, you can go so many places, but there really isn't anything other than your own mind to create the moments. And we're not working with the other actors sometimes. So like I have right. scenes with people that, you know, I didn't actually work with in tandem with their yeah, scenes. Right. So challenging. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you find yourself kind of taking on a, a physicality when you're recording this stuff like it you know you're you're whether you're by yourself or you're on camera are you i, I was listening to an interview with christopher daniel barnes talking yeah. about uh voicing spider-man in that 90s series and yeah, he talked yeah. about how he would kind of he would stand up taller when he was voicing spider-man <laughs> and then shrink yeah. down some to to voice peter parker and i thought that, that, that wasn't interesting yeah and that's 100 percent true the physicality is everything when it comes to voicing some Mm. of these things um one of my favorite voice actors and uh someone i know is uh bob bergen you know the voice of porky pig for 30 Mm. plus years yeah wow like uh all these amazing characters one of his classes that he teaches one of the things he uh leads with and something he learned from a class he took is if you physically play the character the voice will follow and that's very true um Mm. i uh have definitely, you know, I if I'm not sweating by the end of a session that includes a lot of action or includes a lot of things going on, then I know that I need to do more just because I am very physical because it really does subconsciously give something extra to the voice. So I am doing a lot hmm. um, when it comes to these different characters. So Bishop, I love that. we yes. <laughs> talked about a specific line you had in episode three. Yeah. And we were, uh, there's, this, there's this line where you say, time for an exorcism, punks. <laughs> Yes. And <laughs> yes. I would I brought it up before we knew we were gonna get a chance to talk to you in yeah, that very I, I kind of love it. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It, it is. really right. <laughs> I love the campiness of it, the nostalgia yeah. of it. Like normally Robbie knows that's something that turns me off, but for whatever reason I brought it up to say it just feels like it fits so perfectly with what I'm seeing. Yeah. And the show in general does a ton of that. So in general, right. talk to me what it's like to play a character like Bishop have lines like that and deliver them in a way that is campy and fun and not campy and dumb. Well, I'll tell you, I think one of the things that makes this show work is because they're leaning into that tone, which was what the original was. And I think there's a beat. I think there's an area of nostalgia that uh, we in this age group, you know, really respond to because that's Mm -hmm. what we saw in the original show. So they're trying to carry that over and then elevating the themes and the animation at the same time. So while it is, uh, so while it does have that fun and that camp, um, I love being able to say something like that because like something that's like that kind of catchphrase in animation is is not too common for stuff that I that I've done in a long time. So getting a, I like was able to bring everything to that, which I thought was great. Um, mm-hmm. And then following that with like the laser blast, uh, yeah. or the, the blast of energy. That's yes. the longest I've ever screamed in my entire life. Like I held that entire <laughs> thing in that that session. It was really really fun. Um, so getting to play that character in that way is really great for me to have all these great moments. I made this connection recently with Bishop, the character for his own sake, um, because I am, I'm a biracial actor. I'm half black, half white. And so Mm -hmm. by default, I don't fit in any 
category. I'm not in any, I'm not home anywhere really. I, I don't really, mm-hmm. no community. Oh, I don't feel like any. I see any, where you're going. Yeah. And so you see where I'm, I'm saying Bishop is a man out of time. And so he's constantly trying to find where he fits and how he sets into the group and where he's going to go and how he's going to fix things and how to warn people about what's going to happen later by coming back, you know, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So he's all over the place and trying to find his own path and his own way with his own definition of who he is. And so that really resonated with me once I figured that out, you know, over two years later after doing it, I was like, oh, I, <laughs> I didn't even realize this was going on. But I love huh. that part about him. Um, I love that. And I love how he is handling his role in the group so far. Um, it's been fun to take on somebody like that and to be someone that is um, has that kind of importance and has that kind of resonance with people that know who he is. Because it's it kind of interesting because he is a lot more involved than he was, you know, in the original version. Um, so yeah. it's been fun to, uh, yeah. Well, and it's, it, it's interesting because Kyle, uh, is not someone that grew up watching that series. So yeah. it's yeah. been fun talking about X-Men 97 because I've seen the whole thing and then rewatched it recently ahead of the, yeah. the 97 premiere and Kyle has right. not, but Bishop was not a, not necessarily a character that you would consider a, a core cast member, but right. I do feel like his appearances, were pretty memorable and there was yeah. a very specific take that I think was Philip Aiken was, it was, yes, was, he was the original. Yeah. Is that something that you, you know, obviously you have a lot of the original cast members coming back for right. this, that there's some continuity there, but you're also your own person and your own actor. And so you don't yeah. want to just be a slave to that continuity. So like, what was your approach in like uh, taking direction from folks, but then also like, recognizing that you had this original to factor in. I think because of the fact that it was a continuation of the original, I sort of subconsciously already stocked in my head the tone and the feel of the character. That wasn't ever going to go away, like what he stood for, what he was doing and all of that. Um, But what was Mm -hmm. nice is once I kind of came, because we, I sort of came in after the audition having an idea of what I wanted. And then I was sort of guided in the way that they needed for the new show. Um, So, they didn't, I think what was great is the team was open to having the, the people that are, are new and they're coming and are bringing these characters back. They have, mm-hmm. you know, a sense of responsibility. Um, talk about with great power comes great responsibility. Um, mm-hmm. You know, well, here we go. Coming in and bringing the new generation forward, but also allowing our own personal um, uh, viewpoints and our personal touches to come through and not be, uh, not be, pushed back on you know they let us come through with with how we felt about it and how we wanted it to sound and how we wanted to act it um and i when i the audition was pretty close to what you see in the show so i just kind of took Mm. what philip aiken had done and i researched you know the clips and looked at everything and then sort of looked at what the lines were and sort of took it into my own and i was like how can what can i do and what can i bring to this and so i just kind of Mm -hmm. gave my take on it which is all we can do as actors it's like here's my opinion um, and I'm going to put it in the room and if it, it gets taken great, if not fine, you know, I, I don't need, you know, it doesn't, it, it's not needed by me. So mm-hmm. I think Brian Cranston has this great, he has this great viewpoint on auditions where he said, your job is to go into the room, present a compelling, interesting character with the text and then walk away. And it, just in that hmm. motion alone, there is power in that. And so that's sort of what I did with this. Hmm. And by getting the job and coming in, I was able to say, I'm taking this on from Philip from before and keeping that sensibility about who Bishop is at his core, but also get, giving a new spin to it because there wasn't any sort of pushback on you need to stay within this frame. They're like, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to let you kind of move around a little bit. So that made me feel more at ease. I hope that answers your question. That's, yeah, that's no, sort of absolutely. Like. And yeah. I, I'm so glad to hear that that's the approach that the creators took because yeah. it, sometimes you can get a sense when something feels like Agreed. It, it's almost lifeless, you know, if you're yeah. just trying to replicate something. Yeah. Especially with a nostalgia prone project like this. Right. Well, I think that's why I think that's one of the reasons it works is because they've taken care of how the show's going to feel and how the characters the writing is phenomenal. The animation and the mm-hmm. art clearly is phenomenal. The team, the directing teams are all amazing. Um, so they've done a lot of the heavy lifting for us of just making sure mm-hmm. the world is okay. Um I actually have yeah the first page of my script printed out and framed over my desk over here just to remember the moment of when it happened. And it has this whole description of like, here we go. And it's, it's the time of beepers and all this stuff. And we're going to go and back into uh-huh. this world and bring back this soap opera tone. And then in the middle of the page, it says, and with that said, 
previously on X-Men and then gives us the, the preamble before the first episode that came out. So that's oh, been on my wall for a year. Right and yeah, <laughs> that's an amount been on my wall for a year and a half. And that has guided cool me. Through. That? I've been like, OK, we're, we're good. This is going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, man, they really have done a spectacular job. You said this at the very beginning of the uh, the interview here today. The taking the nostalgia and getting the tone right is one thing, but then to elevate it in so many ways, like everything is a little bit better than what I have seen. Of yes. the, like the music's yeah. a step up. Like yes. We, yeah. We, and we're going to talk to them actually here in a minute, but oh, that's great. amazing. <laughs> and then like the, like, like Robbie said, like blending the old voice actors, with the new, and like mm-hmm. if, if somebody has aged out of it, finding the right new voice and then the writing stepped up the themes, like the thematic elements that the show yeah. is talking about and dealing with a step up. Yes. More, yeah. But still has the soap opera camp. Yeah. I, I love it so much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is why I'm not a writer. Cause I couldn't pull off what they're pulling off. Like it's just amazing what they've yeah. done. It's always fun to see something that's so good that you can't even articulate how, how you would do that. Like sometimes yeah. you see something <laughs> right. and it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. there it is. But with yeah. this yeah. series, there are all these moments where I'm like, man, there is some crazy balancing act happening yes. that I cannot even begin to imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And then, you know, adding in adding in humor on top of all of that in the right way that makes us feel like, oh, that was really funny, but it's universal. And if you haven't seen the show, you get exactly what you know, exactly who this character is based off of what's going on. It's it's mm-hmm. all it's all great. So when will you get to see the rest with us? Weekly? Uh, yeah, yes, weekly. Yes, that's when I will get to see the rest. Yeah. The, the only like little preview I had was at the premiere. They premiered the first three episodes on the big screen for us. Okay. Um, so mm-hmm. that's like the most I got to see before other people. But yeah, for me, my experience is, is weekly and then sort of ascertaining what's going on by hanging. I'm trying to hang out with the other cast, like individually, just to get to know them there more. And go. so like, there oh, was like a so hint. Fun. Yeah, there was like a hint to what's happening in this episode, like a few weeks ago. And I was like, no, 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 no just tell me. Don't, I don't want to know. I don't, <laughs> don't want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's so good. Fun. Thank you so much for your time. I'm I'm still thinking yes. about you doing the voice at the beginning of this episode. Like, God, <laughs> Rob, we need to get that work. Can, you need to do the Bishop voice of saying, you're listening to friends from work yeah. is what I need to hear. Okay, I'll do. Okay, here we go. <laughs> you're listening to friends from work. That's so good. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank wow. you so much for your time. We can't wait to see what's in store for Bishop and for the oh, entire yeah. show. So. Yeah, yeah. It's going it's, it's to be good. Yeah. Thank you. Man. Of course. Thank you, You're guys. the best. Man, like I said in the intro, so kind of him to join us. That was so much fun. We love having guests on. It's not like it's not the core of our show, but whenever we get a chance to do it, I'm reminded mm-hmm. of how special the team at Marvel Studios is that they put these people together, how kind all these people are that we get a chance to talk with, and how talented they are. Like, did you hear him jump into the voice? I mean, that is a, like I was truly shocked by yeah. hearing that. That's incredible. I mean, that's going to be our new uh our new intro. Oh, it is today. You better believe it. I mean, it, incredible. <laughs> Just in general. Uh, yeah. So thank you to I him. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you haven't been watching X-Men 97, now is a great time to start watching because it seems like they know what they're doing. I didn't mm-hmm. watch the original show, as we've said so many times, and I'm loving it. So check it out. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Thanks for following this podcast and telling your friends about this podcast. Thanks for supporting our sponsors, and we'll be right back here talking more about the X-Men here on Friends From Work. Mm -hmm.